I'm one of the frontline grunts. I'm one of the people who actually has to use Moodle uh, for survival rather than a living. That I deal with students, and consequently, because I deal with students, I need uh, Moodle to do things when the students ask them, ask it to do it. But I'm also one of the people that Andrew Nichols identified yesterday as one of the peer-to-peer -peer people. I'm the door that's open when we have someone in the corridor who says, uh, I don't understand why my students can't do something. And it varies from why they can't upload files to, look, I'm, I'm really disappointed in this learning management system. It doesn't, it's not handling grade uploads. Okay, what's the, what's the problem? Well, I print everything out and I mark up everything on a piece of paper. How do I put it back into the system? Right. Let me tell you about the joy of grade. <laughs> so this is the, the sort of person that I have had the actual honor and opportunity to work with. I did a PhD on innovation adoption because I'm an academic. So way back in the day, in the 1990s, pretty much before we had innovation, I was looking at what, you know, how you encourage people to do really super new things. And if you're from, if you ever encountered the innovation adoption frameworks, uh, most of us hate the late adopter because they're the ones who say no and they say it so well and so often and so frequently. But in Moodle, we come across two kinds of late adopters. And I'm only going to talk about one of them today. The new to the university, the person who comes in and they've got plenty of experience in some other learning management system. And I always love it when that learning management system is WordPress. I feel for you, I, I do. <laughs> but the one I like is the one who is, we've been at this university through thick and thin, back from when we had charcoal. And they've said no all the way through. So what we want to, what I want to talk about is what motivates the late? What is it that gets the person who goes and says no and no again and Okay, now it's compulsory and the vice chancellor said that it's, I use it or I don't get to keep my job. Stupid thing, what have I got to do? If you've met this person, you probably can hear their voice in your head right now, uh, particularly when you meet new things like the beautifully set out introductory videos, the, the onboarding videos. I saw those yesterday and I thought, these are beautiful. And I could hear the voice of my person in my head going, Stupid thing, doesn't tell me what I needed to know. I clicked through it, got in the way of me doing this. Why can't I do this thing? I can't, I can't learn the thing. Because there was this video in the way of me learning how to use the thing. But yeah, that was the video it was going to teach you. <laughs> Never mind. The, the key thing is, there's, there's three things that really drive the, the reluctant, the reticent, and the resistant. And it was kind of interesting having the reluctance show up last night. Again, thank you, James. I, I wanted some thunder today, but I'd have to import it from Adelaide, I understand. The reluctance is the relative advantage. And this is the conversation about what is the value of Moodle. And I love a good heresy. So Moodle's actually completely useless. If you are in the business of writing on pieces of paper because that's the authentic marking experience, you know, proper academic, versus actually get your job done inside the time that you're allocated it. If you can't show an advantage, if you can't tell someone what they're doing, or what you're proposing that they do is better than what they're doing, they're not coming on board. But the key thing is, we're not also dealing with necessarily fact-based versions of, I find it more fun to mark on pieces of paper because I get a visceral joy of red ink flowing across a page. Introduce them to word track changes and they will find a substitute. When you can kill an entire paragraph and watch it bleed, so we've got to work on that in some of our design things. What is it that gives them the advantage? The other thing I come across and I love is the assumption that everybody already knows. And that's actually uh, 
in Losing Thunder 102, uh, the previous speaker mentioned about the whole idea of that we assume that people already know what we know. But there's also this idea that there's a bunch of people walking around out there going, I can't ask this question because it's so ba it must be so basic. Everyone must know this. I will look like an idiot. So they've decided now that it's better to actually consciously position themselves as the resistant rebel in your face superior lifestyle choice. I'm going to do it because I don't know any other way. It's a fear, and we've got to tackle fears. And there's also my favourite crew. I meet them on a routine basis, and that is simply because they've been told they have to, and just because they had worked out some way of putting over 150 objects into gradebook, we had no actual explanation because they had three assessment tasks. We found it, we kept pressing buttons, we uploaded a thing, it didn't work. We uploaded it again, it still didn't work. Look, just because we're doing it the worst possible way possible doesn't mean we're wrong. So the quick bit, because I'm an academic, there's a quick bit of theory in here. Uh, the key thing that we're running into, and I'm hearing across today, is that there are so many shiny new things in the last two days that there's this little circle down the bottom here. It's under the bit called persuasion. It's not under the bit called actually do stuff. So the actual making people do stuff, what we need is the persuasive bit where you go, this is worth your time. It's sufficiently complicated for you to feel smart. Uh, that's one of the things to watch for. If you are dealing with academics, we like to feel smart. It's a very important part of our day. So make things a little bit harder than you would otherwise. So we feel like we're back in control. Because this is the other thing I come into, is that the feelings, the sensory side. I'll be honest, I w Moodle has reduced me to tears on multiple occasions. At least yesterday it was tears of joy looking at the beauty that was. And I, my Twitter stream will verify that yes, I was sitting in the back of this room crying at the beauty of a Moodle interface. Because it was just so, it would do everything I wanted. It was the dream world. Most of the people we deal with in the resistant don't actually have that sort of sense of love of the business or the love of the software. Yes, they may be reduced to tears, they may also be reduced to swearing, but they have the sensory side, this, uh, the feeling. And if we're used to like, this is more efficient by server load by 22% versus this will make it look pretty. And I heard so many things yesterday about barriers to new things was, yeah, people didn't like the interface. They didn't say it looked pretty. It's like, actually, what we want to do is we wanted to say no. We want to say no, we didn't like it, but we just knew that aesthetic is a really good defense. The other thing you need is uh, if you're going to change someone, uh, this is basically the human equivalent of save, save as. You need to get them to adopt a change. Then you need to get them to do things differently. And then you need to seal them back up again and get them to stop doing things differently. I ran into this one on a slight problem of training people to start thinking about how they could do things differently, which also included not using the platform at all, because they started thinking about, what else could I do? And the answer was, actually, no, all we wanted you to do was start using Moodle. We wanted you to stop at that point, save as, get you on board, because this is the minimum thing we needed you to do, was do this. So this is... Uh, what I'm referring to as the managing the flamingo process. Because your chief problem you're going to have about getting a minimum viable presence is convincing people that they want to do this at the minimum level when they didn't want to do this at all. Of course, the other thing I want to point out is in this room, we are not the minimum standard adopters. I flew an entire length of a country to be here. Some people have gone a large portion of a planet, other people have just gone down the road, but we're in a room, we've come to the Temple of Moodle. It's got statues. This is really cool, it's got statues, but still, we're not minimum standard issue here. Also, um, I just wanna say as a marketer, that every time I hear people say the word value, it's like me pronouncing GitHub as GI thub. I get really nervous. So I understand that we all have our separate languages, but also, seriously, who is this mysterious GI hub? 
So what we want to do, we want to deal from the bottom of the deck. We're going to play the balloons thing. We want to deal from the bottom of the deck. We want the minimum that, that we can get them to remember. And this is the person who has previously had pen and paper as their asset, wants to fight back and say, no, we don't want to do this. So we're trying desperately to get them to remember things. And we all have our different assets. It's the pieces of paper, uh, the videos, the help functions. Um, one of those things on the help function I'd just like to point out is that everyone from analytics, anyone who's in Moodle analytics, don't tell us that you're tracking the help menu. Please. I don't want to know, and I don't want my colleague who feels like a bit of a goose because they can't figure out how that thing, you know that thing where you put, make it go sideways? And you've made it go sideways six times in a row because you didn't realize you had to click outside the menu? They don't want you to know that they, they don't want that experience to be shared with their name and their staff number and their time of login on that. So if we can get them to remember, if we can get them to understand, that's even better. If they actually apply stuff, well, that's just time to go out for drinks. So the question now, what's the minimum, like the minimum viable presence? What is it that they need to have as a minimum? I've got a better idea. What's the minimum viable presence we could give them? What is the bit where we can actually get them to feel the joy we feel? Of course, you know, some of us who work on the code end would possibly also say the word joy is a, a hard find. But again, there is joy. There is that moment where you're looking at something going, this, it's a lifesaver. It does stuff. And getting something useful out of it, this is the minimum valuable presence. The minimum we need is to convince the person who said no that they want to say yes again and come back and learn something new later. So this was one of the challenges we had in the training. And I've just run training on getting people to actually like uh, using rubrics. You know, little, little grids that make your life less hard. Of course, as it was pitched originally was, we want to use rubrics because they're a good quality standard measure to that will improve student evaluations. I said, well, actually, how do you enjoy marking? Most of the people in the room are like, no, we hate marking. In fact, teachers? A little show of hands, people who are actually teaching with Moodle. Show of hands for people who love marking. <laughs> oh, good, I'm not actually on my own on this one. Marking, most, mark, most of the time people go, I don't like marking. So we tell them, look, would you like to do more marking and do marking for longer? And that's how they see a lot of our, uh, we can add six more new ways of giving you feedback. It's like, oh, God, more marking. Or we can say, hey, you know what this does? It gets it done quicker. It's more fun. In fact, you can get marking to be fun. So the question for the minimum valuable is, how little is enough? Uh, this is one of those questions where you should, if you've got a piece of paper in front of you, you'd probably want to write down the key thing of what's the one idea everyone should know. Then you can all swap that over lunch so we've got the minimum bid. Is it the one weird trick? Because we've all been on the internet. We know how good that is as a hook. But I'd say what we're really looking for here is what's the minimum valuable technical skill as the first, but what's the minimum valuable personal skill as the priority? And this is the value. Because resilience is the key thing that Moodle has actually demonstrated, and to the people I've been training in the peer-to-peer, -peer, is that ability to go, oh, I broke it. Oh, God, it's broken. Oh, wait, I broke it. Hey, it got better. There's an undo button. I can fix that. Knowing that they can go for help. But of course, the other thing on uh, resilience is that there's a reason I picked uh, the drink logo for that. Is there's that certain thing of learning how to break things in style. And I just noticed that two of my support people have arrived, so I'm going to tell you, don't break things. <laughs> But if you do, one of the other skills, the basic skills to give someone is that ability to completely and utterly stuff up and go, hey, I broke it, but this is what I was doing whilst I was breaking it. And if they can explain that, then you can at least uh, find out whether it was them, or whether the problem existed between keyboard and chair, or the problem existed further up the line. Because you're ultimately trying to get them to solve something. 
So, as the buzzer goes, I would just say, in the words of a certain quote, very good advice, but uh, I'll seldom follow it. And uh, if you do want the presentation, I, it'll be, uh, well, it is up on the internet right now. It'll be tweeted out in about 10 seconds. Questions? Over here. Have you got any advice for someone who's in an organisation where they don't have any online learning at all and I want to motivate them to start using Moodle? Okay, the official advice would be polish the CV. Uh, the unofficial advice is to convince them, to say what is it we're doing now that this does not just better in terms of like what's their arguments. Again, as a marketer, I go, what's, what's the argument that's gonna sell? Is it money, is it time? Is it, hey, this is actually really neat and you're gonna look really smart doing it? Because that often is a big motivator. Is this, you know, we're not doing it now, why are we not doing it? Is it because other people have done it? You gotta really sort of um, ask them that question of what do you want to get out of this? Cheaper, faster, better, prettier. Newer. So the FOMO type thing, you know, fear of messing out. Uh, of. Don't even sell it as fear. Sell it as <laughs> this is fun. Yeah. I mean, okay. We've yeah. got this, like, here's this immensely cool thing. Do you want to be part of this immensely cool thing? Let's do this. This is, this is great. This is going to be fun. Yeah. Do the Happy Meal approach. I mean, McDonald's doesn't sell hamburgers by saying, you're going to die unless you have a Happy Meal. Don't, don't, don't fear. Sell joy. Any other questions? No? Okay. Exit, stage left.